how much it's going to change the world when computers and cars get married and software is driving our cars. Now, that's scary to some people, but actually I think it's going to be an incredible revolution. There are five pillars that I believe of main change that we'll see. The most important one is saving lives, but there's going to be a huge change to energy. There's going to be a change to our cities, both because of parking and because of traffic congestion, and to our businesses and how we live and get products because of the changes to delivery. Now, I want to start by looking at saving lives because, let's face it, this one should be enough to get you excited about how grand this technology is. The reason that these robots will be able to save lives is because humans turn out to be pretty bad drivers. In the, in the United States, they kill about 33,000 people every year. 1.2 million people die in auto accidents around the world. By the way, only 1,800 in Great Britain, so you're doing pretty well. You're about three, no, two and a half times better than the Americans uh, per kilometer driven. But don't get too smug, because still a lot of people die. It's amazing the numbers because we become blind to them. 12 million injury accidents in the US. In the American National Highway Transportation Safety Agency, they calculated that accidents were costing 300, sorry, $230 billion per year, which if you work it out per mile is about 8 cents a mile, 2.5% of the GDP. That's actually more expensive than the gasoline in a Prius. So when you're driving around in your Prius, and in California it's kind of the law, you have to. Uh, <laughs> you're actually spending more for your share of accidents than you're spending on the gasoline. Now, robots can change this because 40% of those fatalities right now are, are due to drinking, and that's something that robots almost never do. 93% of accidents come from not paying attention, just not looking. Again, another thing we hope the robots are better at. We also lose 41 hours of our lives to, uh, to congestion every year. We have three parking spaces for every car. 60% of the land potentially in Los Angeles, given over to driveways and garages and, and parking lots and all these other things. Americans and drive about half a light year every year, and Britain's about a twelfth or a light month every year. You don't get to use light years and light months in your work too often. By the way, another thing that happens is Americans spend 50 billion hours every year doing this very intense activity. 50 billion hours, they only work 240 billion hours. It's a significant fraction of the entire productive output of that country spent moving steering wheels. Now, there's not just this, but there's energy, too. 25% of the energy of a typical developed country is going towards personal transportation and 25% of the CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. So these numbers are huge, and we become blind to them. But when computers get together with cars, we can change that. Now, why is this happening? This is something you read about in science fiction books very recently, and people still come to me and say, this is science fiction. Now, in Silicon Valley, of course, they have a history of garage innovation, and everyone is kind of amused that we actually get to do it in actual garages. But this is not artificial intelligence making a computer that's as smart as a human being. Turns out driving's not that difficult. A horse can do it. So this is more artificial horse intelligence. <laughs> Maybe even artificial bug intelligence, because bugs can swarm down a channel and not hit each other. So several years ago, the United States military started a series of contests to build these cars. And the first contest was a total failure. Nobody got more than seven kilometers. My friend Anthony entered a motorcycle. He was a bit crazy. He forgot to turn it on. <laughs> but the second contest had five people win going 150 miles through the desert. They went through rough terrain. The winner came from Stanford. Here you see their car driving down the road, going down a steep mountain ravine. And by the way, I'm showing you something from about eight years ago. Things have progressed since then. Um, and this winning car was uh, followed up by a Carnegie Mellon car, and so the people who divided both these teams, this team and the Carnegie Mellon team, which won the contest after that for city driving, were hired by Google, uh, where they've built the next generation of car. This is Chris Armson, the chief engineer, pushing the button, and the vehicle going down the streets of Palo Alto, doing the ordinary things of ordinary driving in a city. Here we see it stopping at a stoplight, making a left turn. By the way, Google has said it thanks these people for participating in their research. <laughs> The Google car has gone over a million kilometers on ordinary streets. Here's a little bit about how it sees, seeing in all directions at once, 360 degrees, identifying everything in the world around it. So they've taken the car through the streets of San Francisco into the left turns and the stopping lights and the traffic that you see in a big city, the stop signs, the joggers who are running in front with the dogs, going through the uh, toll booths on the Golden Gate Bridge, um, going down the entire coast of California. This is the the pretty town of Monterey. We're speeding up a little bit here, going along windy mountain roads, encountering things that frankly would frighten you if you were driving these roads. And look, they're all on the other side of the road too. It should really scare you Britons. 
night and day, the same to the vehicle. They even, for fun, took it down the windiest road in the world, uh, known as uh, Lombard Street in San Francisco, which was full of tourists, and none of them were harmed in the making of this movie. <laughs> so, we've also seen difficult challenges, like merging onto the highway, uh, which is actually one of the more challenging things. Here's a Stanford team teaching their car to park in a way I don't actually recommend. <laughs> so, how did this all happen? Now, you can actually buy a lot of this technology today. In the showrooms right now are cars that will park themselves in parallel parking spaces, keep themselves in the lane, warn you if you're going to leave the lane, uh, keep you a fixed distance from the car in front of you, beep at you if you're about to run over a pedestrian, even hit the brakes for you if you ignore the beeping like an idiot. Uh, all of these things are in the showrooms today, and the car companies are all jumping on and making announcements. Audi's going to have a product in a couple of years. They were showing it at CES. Um, Nissan just started a lab in Silicon Valley where they've been building cars. They were showing them in Tokyo two weeks ago. Actually, the, um, the team here at Oxford has been working together with Nissan and building a car that they're testing on British roads uh, and even having to handle snow, which is actually one of the most challenging things. Um, Nissan actually also announced that they would be selling cars in 2020. Uh, to outdo them, Tesla, about three weeks ago, announced they would have a car in 1996 that drove itself. Now, Teslas are actually fun to drive, um, so this is the last car I'd automate, not that I think any, every car should be. And Mercedes also has announced that in 2020, they will be selling a car that can drive itself. Now, they actually have one you can buy in the showrooms this year that uh, in the fall, the 2014 S-Class, it will handle itself in a traffic jam, you know, very low speed, keep itself in the lane. So you can get something like that. This is not science fiction anymore. So the team at Google, I worked a tiny bit on this, put together a video showing a slightly more futuristic vision, not just on the highway, but a person running their errands for the day. So let's play that video. <laughs> going to push the button there on the console. Oh, Steve. Auto driving. There we go. Away we go. <laughs> Look, Ma, no hands. <laughs> no hands anywhere. No hands, no feet. No hands, no feet. No nothing. <laughs> I love it. So we're here at the stop sign. Yep. Cars using the radars and laser to, to check and make sure there's nothing coming either way. I find myself looking. <laughs> Old habits die hard, man. Hey, hey, they don't die. Hey, anybody up for a taco? Yeah, yeah. What do you want? What do you want to do today, Steve? I'm I'm all for tacos though myself. All right. Well, let's go get a taco at the drive-thru. And we're turning into the parking lot. You know? How many? No, I kind of creep along here. Does anybody have any money? I've got money. No, I've got my wallet right here. <laughs> you roll down your window and order a burrito. Yeah, push that. I'm doing very well. How are you today? This is some of the best driving I've ever done. <laughs> Ninety-five percent of my vision is is gone. I'm well past legally blind. You lose your timing in life. Everything takes you much longer. There are some places that you cannot go. There are some things that you really cannot do. Where this would change my life is to give me the independence and the flexibility to go the places I both want to go and need to go when I need to do those things. So Steve, as you saw, the director of the Santa Clara Valley Blind Center shows you another use for this technology, which is bringing mobility and freedom to a whole class of people who've never had it. And by the way, I don't just mean the people who have disabilities now, like his blindness. I mean all of you as you get decrepit. Um, <laughs> because people stop losing the ability to move around, or, or they find they're relying on their children to get them around. 
This technology will do that as well. Let's talk a little bit about how it works. On top of the vehicle, you saw a prototype sensor, a research sensor, which is a LIDAR. That's a laser that spins around 10 times every second, shines laser beams, invisible ones, off of things, counts how long it takes for the light to get back, and is able to produce a 360-degree view of the world. It's seeing not the way a human being sees and driving not the way a human being drives. We showed you a little clip before of uh, that in action. You see all the circles that are the laser lines painted on the road and the software interpreting all of these three-dimensional images to figure out where the other cars are, the trees, the lanes, everything very exactly so it can drive itself with great precision. So also found on the car is a uh, radar. Radar can see through fog. Radar tells you how fast things are going. It's a very useful complement to the laser. There is a GPS in the car. The GPS actually is uh, not used to drive. It's just used to tell you what street you're on, very much the same way a human being uses a GPS. So what does that all mean, this vision that we just saw in the video? An idea of mobility on demand, picking up your mobile phone and saying, here I am, and I, there's two of us, and we want to go across town. And a vehicle shows up to take you there. And that vehicle might look like a regular car today, but eventually it looks like something designed for that. Maybe it's a workspace with a desk or a screen or a place to watch a video or read a book or maybe it's a living room or face-to-face -face where two people can have a conversation so that you're moving without taking any time out of your life and all that productive time is returned. And all of this happening without central control and without new infrastructure, which is very interesting. So what are the consequences for energy? Well, as it turns out, the economics of cars are based on a question that most people ask when they go into a car showroom. And that question is, what car do I need for my life? They want a car that will meet all the needs of their life. If they ski twice a year, then they feel they need to have an SUV like this. Or if they carry cargo every so often, they buy the number one car in America, which is a pickup truck. Instead of asking this question, if you're getting mobility on demand, you'll ask a different question for your car needs. You're going to ask, what car do I need today? What car do I need right now? And that can be a different answer. That can be the right car for this trip. Well, we're all in our five-passenger sedans or our SUVs, but the reality is most of the trips we take are short trips across town, and they are one person. Now, don't get too smug Europeans thinking we all ride transit. 84% of the passenger kilometers in Europe are in uh, cars. Even the United States is worse at 93%, but you're really not a lot better. It's still all going on in cars, and if you change the economics of cars, you change the economics of energy. We can have vehicles like this XPRIZE winning car that got more than 100 miles per gallon. We can even have little tiny efficient vehicles, electric scooters and so on, you've seen some electrics outside, but vehicles that are even smaller than that actually use less energy per passenger mile than the best transit systems in the world. We will stop using transit because it's too destructive of the environment. It uses too much energy. We'll be able to do better than that. We'll be able to use electric cars because robots don't care how convenient it is to recharge. They're robots. They don't care about anything, really. What that means is that all of the things that are hard about alternative fuels, that there aren't enough stations, or that charging is too hard, or you don't have enough range, or you worry where it is, the robots will worry about that. And that means you don't. And so new types of fuels can beat the 100-year head start that gasoline petrol has over us. This could mean the United States would stop importing oil from overseas, which would mean it would stop doing this pesky habit it has of going to war around the world in order to protect that. <laughs> now, believe it or not, I thought the governments would try and stand in the way of this. And at least in America, they've done the reverse. They've been leaping forward. This is Google's car with the first Nevada license plate for testing autonomous vehicles. And so three states and the District of Columbia have all passed laws to enable it. And people are coming out in favor of it. We're seeing lobbying from all sorts of groups like the AARP that, that are worried about everyone becoming decrepit. Uh, we think people with children will like not being a taxi service for the rest of their lives. We think drunks will love it because uh, you know, they can get wasted and not have to worry about how they're going to get home. <laughs> I also joke that Jews are going to love this car because there's nothing the Jews I know enjoy more than arguing about whether it's legal to ride in this car on Saturday or not. <laughs> now, nothing is perfect, of course. There are some dystopian visions of what might happen if vehicles pick us up at the door and take us everywhere, like you saw in the movie WALL-E. Um, and in fact, instead of being green, I expect some people will say, why don't I have a, a big camper? that comes, follows me everywhere I go. Uh, in fact, why have only one camper when you could have six? And they can form, dock and form a house everywhere you go. Uh, that's not a very green vision. It's within the means of a number of people, though. Uh, there are people who would want to turn this into a military technology as well. As I said, the military actually started it. Uh, we may see positive and negative consequences. It's hard to predict, other than to predict that the consequences will be huge. Now, another issue is whether or not people will accept the technology. And one of the issues is that these 
machines uh, will have some accidents. They won't be perfect. There will be some injuries. And people don't like being killed by robots. So <laughs> they would rather, as it turns out, be killed by drunks. Because that's what's happening today. That's what this is the alternative. So society will actually have to face a decision of whether it wants to adopt a technology that does commit some harm, but does far less than the harm that's being done by people today. And we haven't always made that decision correctly as a society. So that's a concern for me. And there are some folks who will try and get in the way of this as well. I'm not sure, name, I'm not going to name the profession. But um, <laughs> the, people are fascinated by the liability question here. Who's liable if a car is driving itself, hits you, and so on? The truth is, you always pay, drivers always pay. We either pay more for insurance or we pay more for cars. The money's all going to come out of your pocket. If there's less accidents, less money is going to come out of your pocket. But the barristers will be actually sitting there and be greatly concerned about whether the money flows through their clients or not. That's basically what the issue is going to be. And let's be fair, we're still looking at prototype technology that's forecast for the later part of this decade. So there is a small matter of programming to be done. Uh, somewhat different from this picture. But what excites me and what got me into this was the idea that Moore's Law, which we treat as sort of a gospel at Singular University, and then we, we have a little altar and we worship it every afternoon. Um, Moore's Law is going to come to transportation. If transportation had a Moore's Law, it would be transportation gets twice as good every couple of centuries, right? not every two years. But now the computer is going to be the most important part of the car, more important than the engine when it comes to how people choose the car. And the computer will be getting twice as good every couple of years. We're going to see competing innovators working here, and that's going to fight against the 19th century approaches that have been involved in most transportation planning. And I come from the internet world, and many of the people building this technology come from the computer internet world, not from the car world. And we live that way. We live with this world of competing innovators. We like to think of it as a battle between you know, the municipal administrator style and early adopters. Now, you know early adopters, right? They're basically stupid people with too much money. They'll go and they'll buy the 5S of something two months after they bought the 5 of it, just because, even though they're still under contract. <laughs> but I love them because they want to be on the cutting edge, and they'll buy new technologies like this, and they'll drive it. And technology that's built by innovative companies and can be sold to early adopters, that's the technology that can grow exponentially and change the world. People say it'll take 30, 50, 40, 60, some number of years before you can replace the cars in the world. But look at the phones. We replace them every month and a half, it seems. And we replace computers certainly every two years. All done bottom up rather than the central control approach. Let's very briefly look at some other consequences for cities. And I have a huge amount of stuff about this that you can look at on my website if you want more detail. But one of the interesting realizations is that these cars don't have to park. If they're taxis, they just drop you off and go and pick up someone else. Even if they're your own car, They'll go and store themselves somewhere, but they do what's called standing. They can move out of the way. They can pack densely. They can park in front of people's driveways, fire hydrants, all those things. And that means we don't need the same parking infrastructure for them. In fact, I've calculated the roads are enough. We won't need parking lots anymore. Think about how much of our cities and our towns and so on have been given to parking lots. So my dream, by the way, is we'll take some of the parking lots, at least a few of them, and turn some of them into parkland. I know many people would rather turn them into office complexes, but we can't get everything. We're also going to see an ability to change the traffic which has snarled our cities and our lives, both by what the robots do and by smarter communications technology that allow us to repurpose our roads, put cars closer together, make the smaller cars that are half the width of a normal car. I have theoretical, admittedly, calculations which show we could fit almost 15 times as many people down the roads as we do today if we did everything. We won't get to that level, but we're going to see a significant increase. And then I want to talk about delivery because this is actually one that's not being talked about much right now. Now, I don't know about Britain, but in the United States, there is one product which is so vital, so important, that you must be able to get it within 30 minutes, no matter where you are. <laughs> Someone told me here it's a curry, but um, this product is very important. But what if you can get every... Sorry, no, go, go back, actually. Uh, what if you can get... Go back, actually. Thanks. What if you can get anything? in 30 minutes, anything at least that you could find in a, in a big warehouse shop and so on. And the Walmarts and so on actually, which have scared off the small retailers, now should be scared of the people who can have a tiny robot bring you anything you want, five pairs of shoes so you can try them on and send four of them back, all in 30 minutes. So retailing and the stores and the shops, everything else, so many aspects of our city have been governed by transportation. Transportation is in many ways the purpose of a city. 
You live in a city so you can have a short time to your friends and the interesting shops and the places you work. So as transportation is rewritten by computers, so much of our lives will be. So I've said we should have an Apollo-like mission, that we should set ourselves the goal before this decade is out <laughs> of a computer driving a man to lunch at noon and returning him safely to work. But John F. Kennedy said something even better, that we should do some things not because they're easy, but because they're hard. This is hard, but it's doable and is going to change the world. So thank you very much. So Brad, often when there's a great new technology that solves a problem, there are vested interests that get in the way that try and block its application. And you can tell that the robocar is going to put a lot of people out of jobs. It's not great yeah. if you're a taxi driver, a delivery driver. And as you say, the legal profession is starting to mount challenges. So in a real world, how long do you think it is before all of us here can expect to be driven home by a self-driving car? Um, I would say June 22nd, 2026 at 4 p.m. <laughs> so you should never give an answer to the, to the date and the how long. Um, so it, there's a whole range of answers, right? So if this is adopted like other car things are adopted, it takes decades. But if it's adopted like DVD players or mobile phones or, or all the other devices that are electronic, it could be very, very fast. And if it's mobility on demand, so how long does it take you to switch to an Uber or other company like that? You can switch in an instant. You may take a little time to sell your car. And I want to talk about those folks, um, as you say, who make their living from driving. Four million professional drivers in the United States. I don't know the number in Great, in Great Britain. It's probably commensurate. Um, you know, all of these technologies that we talk about here at this conference and at SU are going to disrupt and take away jobs. And when I was young, everyone said a robot was going to take over all your jobs. And by the way, the robots did. And there's still more employment than there ever was. So I have some hope for that, although not entirely. We, we cover, actually, some of the things about technology changing so quickly that it's harder and harder for humans to retrain. But let me put it to you another way. I talked about 1.2 million people dying in car accidents around the world. 500,000 of them, by the way, are pedestrians in the less developed world. Um, I talked about a quarter of the entire productive time of the major developed countries being spent on this. Uh, that time is so huge that it sadly dwarfs uh, the economic effect of the job loss. And it's not because I want this job loss, and it's not because, in fact, anyone who's building this, unlike a, like an industrial factory robot, you could say, why are you building this? I'm going to replace factory workers. I'm going to be cheaper for the factory that buys me. Nobody building this is saying, I want to replace human drivers. They want all those other goals. So I hope that's some answer to the people who are worried about their job, because it's not a, I mean, it's not a great answer for them, but it's something. Great talk. Thank you, Brad Templeton. Thank you.